It's always a great pleasure to come to Science World for the girls at Steve event. ACUTE is strongly believes in giving back to the community and in the benefits that can be realized from incorporating equity, diversity, and inclusion in the workplace. So we are thrilled to partner with Science World to support the Girls in STEAM program, where professionals from academia and industry can engage with youth in a fun and creative atmosphere to inspire the next generation. Earlier today, while I was volunteering at the Acutus Egg Drop booth, I particularly enjoyed seeing the energy, passion, and curiosity of the participants as they constructed their unique egg delivery vehicles. We learned about problem solving with limited resources and the engineering design cycle. And while not everyone's eggs survive the fall, sometimes learning what doesn't work can be just as valuable as learning what does. Hopefully some of you here today have been inspired to pursue a career path in one of the STEAM fields, and that one day, many years from now, when I'm ready to retire, there will be a massive influx of bright, qualified women ready to take over the world. So now, the moment we've all been waiting for, because you didn't come here to Science World to hear me speak, it's my utmost pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, Andini Makasinski. From Saanich on Vancouver Island, Andini is most famously known for her sustainability-focused inventions, including the hollow flashlight, which she invented when she was in just grade 10. Since then, she's appeared on multiple TV shows, written a book, and model for many companies. I don't know what she does in her spare time because she seems like she's really, really busy. <laughs> and Dini is most passionate about the crucial yet often overlooked combination of science and art and reconnecting with one's creativity and imagination. Following Andini's pre presentation today, we're gonna have time for questions from the audience. So uh, think about what you might wanna know more from Andini and keep that question ready to the end. Uh, so without further ado, Let's give it up for Andini. Hello. Ooh. Oh my goodness. I am so sorry. I just attacked your ears. All right. Off to a great start. Hi, everyone. How is everyone doing? Good. Good? I'm glad to hear. I was wandering around some of the workshops earlier, and it looks like everyone is very engaged in smashing strawberries and creating distracting tigers and all sorts of things. So I'm so glad everyone's had a wonderful time. I so wish when I was your age, I sound very old right now, but when I was your age, I wish I had stuff like the stuff Science World is doing right now, today, and all week and all year. So I'm very happy that everyone here has turned out. All right. So welcome, I'm very honored to be your keynote speaker today. I actually was here back, I think on the first STEAM day with Science World five years ago in 2018. I'm wearing the same top as I did five years ago, which I'm happy about. Um, but yeah, so excited to be here. My name is Andini, I am 26 years old and I grew up on Vancouver Island. Is anyone here from Victoria? Oh, that counts. Amazing. Uh, so I grew up in Victoria my whole life. Uh, I went to university for a few years at UBC here in Vancouver and then returned to UVic. Uh, I just moved to London a few weeks ago, though, so that's where I live now. Um, and yeah, so this is a picture of me when I was a fetus with vault meters in my mouth, which I survived. I wouldn't recommend, but I survived it. Um, and so I'm here to tell you a little bit about my life with many different passions in the sciences and the arts and how I've been able, or at least trying, uh, actively been trying to combine them and pursue everything that I love. Because if there's one thing that I hope you take away from today and all these amazing experiences you've had is just to follow your passion, whatever it is, and know whether it's in the sciences or in the arts or maybe a mix of both, you can make a difference. All right, so, Darn, I can't actually see anybody in the audience, but who here has a phone? Make a sound. Okay, so I would say majority. Can you make a sound if you don't have a smartphone? Amazing, okay, that's more voices than I expected. Um, all right, so I grew up without a smartphone. I didn't get one until I was 19, uh, after I left for university and my parents were worried that I was being abducted every time I traveled alone, which is totally fair. I actually got a flip phone first. Does anyone have a flip phone? Couple, okay, I see you. I can't see you, but I, I hear you. Um, and so, 
Phones are very interesting because it's actually, they're actually a really cool combo of science and art. Um, and you know, it's the science and the technology that works so well. There's incredible cameras on our phones like never before. We're able to communicate with people all around the world. It can solve problems for us, the calculator, everything. But it's also, we expect technology to be aesthetically pleasing, to be beautifully designed and part of our fashion nowadays. We don't carry around the same clunky brick phone that we had well, you guys did not have, but back in the 90s or 80s, I'm assuming, phones were very literally like bricks that you would carry around. So, you know, technology has changed a lot, and technology and science and the world around us requires scientists and artists to come together and collaborate. But in the educational system, we're still seeing this very big divide between the science classes and the art classes. And this also creates stereotypes between the people who love science and STEM versus the people that love arts, which is why I'm so excited that we're really trying to champion STEAM instead, right? Which is science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. And our whole world actually, in many ways, is kind of this amazing combination of science and art. Just look around you. Well, you can't see anything, it's totally dark. But, you know, even, this microphone that I'm holding, for example, it's not some huge rectangular box, you know, it's designed to be easy to hold and aesthetically pleasing, but the science and the text so that you can actually hear what I'm saying is also behind it. Everything, down to the sneakers you wear, are this incredible combination of design and science and function coming together. So I don't want any of you to discount any interest or passion that you have in the sciences or the arts and weigh them against each other because they can often come together in really beautiful and unique ways. Um, I just wrote a book called The Inventing Mindset that won't be out for another year or so, but I got to interview a lot of my really cool friends that have found ways in their lives to combine science and art. So I'm curious, has anyone here heard of Merritt Moore? No, okay. Oh, one person. So Merritt is this really incredible lady that I interviewed for my book. Uh, she's a professional ballet dancer and dan dances with all sorts of, I think she's with the Boston Ballet right now, but all over the world she dances. But she's also like an astrophysicist who started, studied at like amazing Ivy League schools. And so what she's done is she built her own huge robotic arms and she programmed them so that during COVID when she couldn't dance with anybody, she could dance with these huge robot arms. Um, and there's really amazing videos of her online talking about her work and performing all around the world. And I get really inspired by friends like that who have these different passions and don't go, oh, well, I can only do one or the other. Or a lot of times it's, oh, well, you know, the science part is given more weight in society and more respected, so I'm going to forget about my hobbies in the arts. I actually went and studied acting for a year in New York when I was 21. And I remember that summer when I was at you know, various conferences and meeting important business people, I'd be like, they'd be like, oh, so what are you doing? And I was like, I am studying acting. And they were all like, why? Why are you doing that? And I think it's really important that we start looking at these kind of stereotypes and biases that we've created between the sciences and the arts and stop judging people for pursuing one or the other, but instead celebrate people that are these kind of Renaissance individuals which is what I hope a lot of you guys will slowly morph into, which are people that have many different passions in both the sciences and the arts and try and do both. So a great example from your, I think how I say, is uh, Leonardo da Vinci, who was this amazing painter and artist, but he also invented a lot of really advanced technology. And I think it's those kinds of people that bring the arts and sciences together that are our future, and hopefully that's all of you guys. All right, so a little bit backtracking about me. My first toy was a box of transistors and other electronic parts, and from there I would take my hot glue gun and garbage from around the house and piece together my very first completely not working garbage inventions, but my mom was very excited and kept all of them. Um, I was also raised on silent films from the 1910s and 20s. Has anyone seen a silent film? One person. Okay, go watch, go go home and watch a sh silent film. Watch Charlie Chaplin, Buster Keaton, Harold Lloyd. They were amazing innovators in film and the way that we watch movies nowadays wouldn't be the same without them. So it was raised on silent films, was raised in classical opera. Has anyone watched an opera? 
amazing, some people have. Uh, so my interests were slightly different than some of my classmates. Um, but I'm really glad that I had these kind of eclectic interests and as an adult have hung on to them for dear life. Um, so I love tinkering and taking things apart and I would go to a lot of after school kind of science Lego Mindstorms clubs. Does anyone do stuff after school in science? Yeah, yeah I guess this is like before school because it's the weekend, but um, So I did science fair projects uh, starting when I was in grade six and I ended up doing 10 science fairs before I graduated high school. So I was just doing science fair all the time, drowning in science fair, but in an enjoyable way. Um, and most of my projects were in the area of alternative energy harvesting, which is harvesting energy that's always around us, but we don't necessarily take advantage of regularly just yet all the time. Uh, so I was interested in solar cells, piezoelectric disks. Does anybody know what those are? A couple of people, yeah. So piezoelectric disks have these piezo crystals on them that when you put a bit of pressure or vibration on them, they actually produce a very small electric charge. So they, what they've done in Europe somewhere, they actually took these piezoelectric disks and put them underneath the dance floor. So when you stomped and jumped on it, they actually would produce energy, which is really incredible. Um, so I became interested in those, and I also became interested in Peltier tiles, otherwise known as thermoelectric generators. Has anyone played with those? A couple of people, yay! <laughs> okay, so basically, um, I'll just call them Peltier tiles because that's easier. It's this technology that's been around since the 1800s, and basically there's many tiny junctions of two dissimilar metals, and when you heat one side of the tile, um, like, the, sorry, the metals are inside this tile, ceramic tile, and when you heat one side of the tile and you cool the other, you get a very small amount of electricity produced. So what, oh wait, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, so I was doing all these science fair projects. Um, and okay, so the inspiration for one of my projects came from actually my Filipino roots. Is anyone here Filipino? Yeah, we got some people, amazing. So my mom's from the Philippines and when I was 10 or 11 years old. Well, I did go to preschool there for a bit as well, but when I was 11, uh, we went and visited and I made some friends and I decided to stay in touch with some of them on Yahoo Messenger. And all of you are too young to know what that is, which is oh, tragic, but, ah. <laughs> um, oh, okay. So I would write to my friend Maria on Yahoo Messenger and she would go to an internet cafe where she could pay to access the internet because that was just, the way it was for her. And she wrote to me one day and told me that she had failed her grade in school. And I was really surprised because she was just like me, just some different part of the world and you know, did well in school. So I asked why. And she said, oh, well, my family can't afford to pay for electricity right now. So I don't have any light to study with at night. And for me to be, I think I was 13 or 14 years old to hear this and living in a more fortunate situation where I would just flick on the light switch every day and just expect it to work, that really took me aback. And I decided I, try, I wanted to try and create a light source that wouldn't require any batteries for my friend's problem. So I ended up using the Peltier tiles that I had experimented with in previous science fair projects, and I created a flashlight that ran off the heat of the human hand. So that was the very first prototype, this one with the smaller white tiles. Um, so I would put my hand on one side of the tiles to heat it, and I would cool the other side with this hollow aluminum tube that would allow for maximum air convection currents to flow through and around the tube and cool it even further. And then I ran the small amount of power that I produced through a voltage boosting circuit, and I was able to light up a few LEDs. Um, so that was my project in grade 10, uh, and then at the end of my grade 10 year, I was told about this thing called the Google Science Fair, and I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll apply. Totally forgot. Night of the deadline, I was like, oh my god, I want to apply for this Google Science Fair. 
So we had the option of submitting a PowerPoint about my project, which I did not have one, or a video. So I was like, Dad, come quick. So we like sat me down on the couch in the living room and we just filmed this haphazard video for two minutes of me going, hi, my name's Anne. And da, da, da. I didn't know how to speak in front of the camera. I uh, talked about my flashlight, submitted that to the fair, forgot about it. And as I was finishing up my grade 10 year, I was suddenly getting all these emails that I had been accepted as one of the 90 worldwide finalists for the Google Science Fair, and then there was a second round of evaluation, and suddenly I was one of the 15 finalists around the world who would get to go to the Google headquarters at the start of my grade 11 year and compete. Um, so it was all just very surprising, uh, and I was really lucky to win my age category at the Google Science Fair, and that is kind of where my life sort of changed because that very embarrassing video of me went viral and then I started doing all sorts of talks and appearances. And it was interesting because at this time, I loved science fair, but I also really loved the arts. I was doing all the musicals, all the plays. I was helping my family with like taking care of film archives for a musician. And I was also helping my dad being second camera on a lot of his own documentary shoots. So I had this whole side of me that loved the arts, but because I got so much attention in the sciences at a young age, everyone assumed that was what I was supposed to do, and I was going to become an engineer, and that was the only thing I could possibly be interested in. And I found it really frustrating and also really confusing at 15, 16 years old, being told, oh, well, you're good at science, so you should do, do science. And I went, well, maybe that is what I should do because that's what everyone else is telling me to do. I also had a lot of pressure from home to go into engineering, um, and my parents had both immigrated from different countries, from Poland and the Philippines to Canada, and the last thing they wanted me to do was to run off and become someone in the arts. They wanted me to get a study job in the sciences, or be a doctor, be a lawyer, I'm sure some of you guys can relate, and it was a lot of pressure for teenage me to face. Uh, my second invention in grade 12 was the e-drink, which is a coffee mug that harvests the excess heat of your hot drink and converts it into electricity. So eventually, if you drink a lot of coffee, you could give your phone a boost of energy. Um, I presented it on The Tonight Show with Jimmy Fallon. I also presented my flashlight the year prior to this, also on The Tonight Show with him. Um, and that was really fun. I competed at the Intel International Science and Engineering Fair, which when you guys are about one or two years older, you can also start competing towards, maybe some of you have gone. I don't know. Uh, but I know the Canada-wide science fair I did twice as well, and I loved it. I had such an amazing time because science fair wasn't really something done in my school. And suddenly when I went to the local science fair or the Canada-wide, I met all these people that were my age that were equally passionate about whatever the heck they had done their project on. And it was such a fun time. So if there's anything I can encourage you guys to do, try out science fair while you're still young and have the time because as adults science fairs are not really happening as much um and yes i had a wonderful time also science fair even though it's called science fair is actually a really cool combination of science and art skills that you need for example with an invention or a piece of research you're doing you need the science part you're looking around for a problem, coming up with a hypothesis, an objective. You conduct the experiment, you make the prototype, you uh, amalgamate your results, but then you have to write a whole written report on your project, so that's a lot of writing skills. Then you have to make a poster that is easy to read, which believe me, does not happen often, and is nice to look at, that explains your project, and then you have to be able to perform, to present your project to anybody who walks by. If they're you know, a professor who's an expert in that field or they're like an eight-year-old that's just walking by with their school and wants to know what your project is about. So you learn all these great communication skills. And so science fair really is great training in the sciences and the arts. And honestly, most of the skills that I learned in high school came from science fair and not necessarily from in the classroom. Okay. Um, so after that, I've gotten to, I've been very, very lucky to do a bunch of very cool things. Um, and weirdly, my path in the sciences also led me to have way more work in front of camera, albeit as myself at first, and then I was started to model for friends like Maybelline and um, Uniqlo, and I filmed with Miley Cyrus for Converse, and all these things, and I feel very, very lucky because it's not something 
I ever, ever expected to do. And when it came to university, and I know I talked to some of you earlier, and a lot of people are kind of maybe starting to think about that and what they want to do, I was very conflicted. I think knowing at 17 what you want to do for the rest of your life is like really daunting. It's really scary. And a lot of my friends who went into university saying, oh, I want to become this, came out of university with a totally different degree and had completely changed their mind. So I actually really encourage you in your first year of university, which I know for some of you is a little while off, but to do something actually quite general, like do a general first year in the sciences or the arts and try as many different things as possible and really figure out what you hate doing and what you love doing because knowing that will give you the information going forward to really figure out what it is you want to do. Um, and so for me, I guess my circumstance was a little different, but because I'd received so much attention for doing science fair at a really young age and for inventing, I felt like there was a lot of pressure to do science. And with me, sometimes when I feel that pressure, I kind of run away in the opposite direction. So what I managed to do, and I can talk about this more in the Q&A, was I actually ended up doing a degree in English literature and film studies, uh, so I could learn about art and storytelling, my other big passion inside of school. And then outside of school, I started my own company. I got patents for both my inventions in Canada and the US. I continue to invent and so many other things. All right, so I just wanted to emphasize you can do science, you can do art, you can do both in middle school, high school, later in your life. That's me in various musicals with horrific makeup on. Uh, I think that was Oliver, and the musical Oliver in the Secret Garden. And then that's me soldering when I was eight or nine years old. Um, and so you can do both. So never limit yourself in what you believe is possible. I love this quote from this guy, Phil Cousineau. He writes a lot of really incredible books about creativity. And he said, creativity isn't a luxury, but a necessity, a means of survival. You are all innately creative. Even if you don't believe it, I had an art class in middle school and the teacher would never allow us to say, I can't draw or I'm not good at art. She would literally like send us to the corner if we said it. And I actually really appreciate this because I think as we grow older, we often have a lot of limiting beliefs of, oh, I'm not a creative person or I'm, I think a certain way. Um, and I really wanna encourage you that creativity, especially with AI coming up, Creativity and your imagination are this amazing superpower that make you a unique individual. It was interesting, this magazine cover was generated by AI. And I think a lot of people are scared of AI and how it's gonna change the job market and how we live our lives. And I know some of you guys had a workshop with AI sort of late, uh, earlier today. And the one thing I will say is, I think it's important that you familiarize yourself with AI and the technology and how it's gonna be changing our lives and the way we work. I wouldn't rely on AI, like kind of like you're falling back on it at all times. I think what it is good is if you have an idea for an invention, propose it to ChatGPT and see what, it can, what advice it can give you on the next steps, but then still go through and do it yourself. Um, I think the danger that a lot of people fear is just falling completely on AI, and AI is doing everything for us. Um, but we've always been scared of new technology. This is a silent film, gasp, uh, from 1927 called Metropolis, and they were predicting what life would be like, I believe in 2026, I could be wrong, and basically it was that we were all gonna be slaves to the machinery and only work to maintaining the machinery, and we wouldn't be able to tell between when someone was a robot that was going to destroy society or like a real life person. Uh, so we've always been worrying about technology or like Black Mirror episodes now on TV. We're always worrying about the unknown, but I think with the inventing mindset and being an inventor, you have to embrace the unknown and what could happen or what might happen and just go for it because when you're an inventor, you're building your own reality. You're building your own future. All right, I have to do the next very quickly so we have time for the Q&A. Uh, be open to inspiration, it can arrive at any time. I always carry around a notebook and a pen and I write down ideas as soon as they come or I draw them out. This is a quote actually about poetry that I love. For the mind in creation is as a fading coal which some invisible influence, like an inconstant wind, awakens the transitory brightness. And I think it's really important as soon as you get an idea, don't shoot it down, write it down draw it, record it, whatever it may be. 
I think as, as we grow into adults, we often have ideas and go, oh, but that's not possible. I don't know how anything about this area. It would take too long. I don't have any money to fund it, da, da, da. I think now you're at this crucial age where you're open to all your ideas. And I want you to take your ideas and go, yes, and what a da, 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 and run with it because you never know where it could lead to. And I think with all my inventions, they came out of this sort of spontaneity and openness to my ideas instead of shutting them down. Um, I encourage you to stick out. Follow your passions, no matter how eclectic or bizarre. I was really embarrassed often a lot of the time about my science fair projects when I was younger because I didn't want people to think I was a nerd and did science in school. And in fact, it was the fact that I did my science fair inventions that made me stick out and that made my kind of unique story and life path. So I encourage you to follow all the different passions you have in science, in art, and be proud of it. It takes bravery to have multiple interests in the sciences and the arts. It's much easier to just go, oh, well, I like this one thing, and I only do this one thing, and that's it. So I really encourage you to pursue all your different passions. Failure, failure is very important, especially when you're young. If I told you the amount of times I've embarrassed myself, I have failed epically. I failed last month in front of a whole group of people. You know what? It's totally fine. I encourage you to celebrate the times that you failed and use it as a learning experience to go, OK, that didn't work because of X, Y, Z. Let me not do that again. Instead, try other things. For example, um, a couple years ago, I worked on a whole line of children's toys that ran off of green energy. And I spent two years working on this every day, coming up with stories and TV shows and all these things about them. And then I signed some really bad business deals and got myself into a huge mess. And I had to leave behind everything I'd worked on for two years. And it was so embarrassing for me to tell my parents that I had just failed epically. And it was a big lesson, but it was a very valuable lesson. And I'm so glad it happened to me at so young instead of just going on and not realizing. So don't be afraid of failure because it just teaches you more about yourself. It gives you more information going forward. Um, again, communication. This is why I love the arts. There's actually a whole group um, that teaches scientists improv, and they travel all around the world and do workshops for a couple of days teaching improv comedy to scientists so they can learn how to better communicate their ideas. And I really encourage you guys, even if you don't have any interest in acting or be becoming a comedian, take an acting class, take an improv class. It pushes you out of your comfort zone and helps you so much with communicating your ideas. All right, that is all for me. I will take your questions now. Thank you for listening.